uh, yeah, you know, this, this endeavor to uh, create the International Day of Happiness and then to make it a reality, uh, turn an aspiration into a reality uh, that has legs and a life of its own, uh, as we've seen today, uh, really began from, or I should say is rooted in a, a, a range of, of, of things. First is uh, my experience growing up uh, around orphaned and abandoned children after I myself was, was rescued. And that experience right. left an indelible impression on me about the human condition. And, and in, a, in a sense, I sort of went through life like everyone else, but also had a sense of responsibility to do something about the situation that I grew up in and that I saw in, in around the world. So uh, uh, the uh, International Day of Happiness was something that presented itself uh, uh, just about seven years ago. Um, it was a, a concept that came together based on thinking about how uh, to uh, advance new metrics and new ways of thinking about the global economy and about our economic systems and human development systems, uh, yeah. something I studied in school and, and worked on throughout my career. And, uh, you know, we came together uh, in uh, 2011 after a multi-year initiative and proposed it to the United Nations. And, and when it happened, it was honestly quite a surprise when there was a yes. It wasn't something we were prepared for. Uh, in fact, the, 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 the entire day is something that we haven't really been prepared for. We've sort of been playing catch up for, for every year because of the excitement that everyone has, has and, and just the ind individual initiative around the world to make this a success. Great. Okay, that's great. Well, thanks so much for the for the context to understand just a little bit of your your story. And, um, you know, uh, I'm sure everyone joining us will be really interested to, to hear that in more detail. Uh, um, you know, in, in their own explorations and, and maybe on a, on a future webinar. Uh, so, Luis, uh, you are the driving force behind Happiness Agora and B, and all of these fantastic events that uh, might have been uh, appearing in people's Facebook feeds as part of the World Happiness Virtual Agora. Uh, so, Luis, I'd, I'd love to hear just a, a little bit about your story and, and how you came to this movement. Yes, well, Thank you so much. So exciting being here and, and so exciting being with Jamie. Um, I think that basically today we are having, it's, it's a spectacular because this whole week, it's more than 168 uh, thought leaders, thought provokers, guides, gathering together all over the world in order to share the insights, the passion about how to create a world with more happiness and less misery. But actually, uh, I, part of my inspiration, I would say, most of the inspiration came from knowing that actually Jamie, Jamie was pushing to get the International Day of Happiness approved. I think that we all know that Bhutan, uh, 47 years ago, and the king of Bhutan had this magic idea of measuring the progress of humanity, and especially his citizens, um, through happiness instead of uh, economy or wealth, uh, and that was a big, big inspiration for everybody. And Jamie knows that that was huge for the United Nations actually finally ratifying the day. But part of my inspiration, personal inspiration, comes from having seen a drama in post armed conflicts like Bosnia. I was an international observer with the United Nations, and I and I saw what happens when you have wars. And I saw the drama that you, that you create. There is, an, there is not a good word. That's, a, that's something that you really learn when you go through it. And when you see that a, in order to avoid that to happen again, actually you need happy people because happy people don't kill other people. And happy people are, are, are basically in a state where they use an abolic energy and they actually build instead of destroy. So I think that that was the combination of seeing drama, the combination of uh, seeing Jamie creating the day, and the combination of seeing countries and, and monarchies, just such as Bhutan, pushing for the whole country to be a uh, happier overall. I think that was my source of personal inspiration to try to unite the world and get as much happiness and as less misery as we can. Quite, quite a small ambition there. That's, well, that's very inspiring. Thanks very much for, for sharing a, a bit of your story of how you, how you came to connect to this, uh, this movement. So 
now that we understand a, a bit about our guests and, and how they've come to, to be doing this work, um, I'm excited to, to dive into some of the questions. So we, we had a bit of voting on, on Facebook um, for, for people to sort of say which, which questions uh, they, they were most interested to cover. So um, first of all, in, in my own work uh, doing uh, help, helping organizations in, in, in business and um, in the public sector, in, in, in the uh, social purpose sector, tell their stories. This is a, a particular interest to me. Uh, so we, our first question is, what stories uh, do you find particularly help new communities to identify with the well-being movement? And it seems like identity is a really powerful force for people taking action in the world. Um, so, uh, Jamie, would you, um, would you like to say a, a bit about that? Are there any stories? I mean, we've, we've seen how powerful your and Luisa's stories are. Um, are, there, are there any particular stories that you found that the people resonate with to, to be able to step a bit out of the pressures of the world that we live in and try and think about, well, what's actually more meaningful? You know, how, how do I build a happy and, and, and meaningful life? Uh, yeah, so a really great question. Thank you for that. And uh, it, uh, your question or the question of the, the, that was proposed is really hits to the heart of, of what this movement is about, what this day is about, and the importance of carrying the message of happiness forward as we go on. Um, and I'd like to say with respect to stories, you know, there are literally hundreds, maybe thousands of stories that I, I have been through in my life that I would say speak to the topic that you're talking about, that we are in a divided culture and yeah. that there and 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 and, and or that things are we, we are in a divided period and yet we have so much in common as human beings. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, every day working in the various fields that I've worked in, business, politics, uh, nonprofit, etc. Um, I've seen different things. Uh, people treat each other with uh, enormous compassion, love, kindness, and respect, and take great sacrifices to help others. Um, you know, when I see something like that, uh, I realize that just how powerful love is and how powerful uh, the feeling that is inside of every single human being is, somewhere inside of everyone. Um, we are all connected. And so I, I, I just, I, it's hard for me to speak about one story specifically, but I'll say I've been through thousands. One story I do want to highlight in response to this question that truly answers uh, what has been inspiring and what I think resonates with why this movement for happiness and well-being for all people, for communities, for societies, for governments to take on as a priority. One story that I see that I think really highlights this has been the story of the, sorry, the, story of the International Day of Happiness, frankly. Um, this is something that when we brought it to the United Nations and uh, got the approval to sort of draft the resolution and go through the campaign and, and get every country behind it and eventually be successful was not something that we had necessarily a plan. We weren't event, events managers or, or we didn't have the ability to sort of a roadmap of, for experience of this is how you build a day. And what happened is that we sort of went about it almost through word of mouth, uh, telling friends, uh, going door to door in New York uh, uh, to establishments and, and just people that we knew in our community amongst friends. And it grew into a global movement very naturally, very in a very democratized process. And that's probably the greatest story that is, that, that, that is part of the history of this day and the part of the history of all of us is that without much effort from the standpoint of having a centralized organizing force around the world, people have on their own initiative on their own uh, desire to do something about the human condition, stood up for the idea of happiness as an idea that unites all of us. And it's been really amazing. Uh, it's been unbelievable. It's been so inspiring. It's, I'm honestly speechless every day about it, uh, including today. And um, you know, I, I, I say that because we are in a period where governments and the people in positions of leadership in many places are out of touch with the way people think and feel on the ground. And yep. as a result, it, we have a global travesty of democracy in many ways. And, you know, it, when seeing the, the individual initiative of this happiness movement that have brought together researchers, experts in all the fields that happiness represents, as well as everyday global citizens to come together and celebrate happiness as a human right and as a fundamental human goal and as a model for global development, for human development, economic development, sustainable development, that story, seeing that come together 
has been so inspiring. And I urge everyone who is out there watching this or celebrating the day or thinking about it to continue because this is just the beginning. So thank you. That's great. That's really inspiring. Thanks a lot. Um, Luis, the, the next question that um, people were interested in was, was about what meaningful actions can people take to, to start contributing? And, um, you know, obviously, happiness is really a, a right for, for everybody and an, and an opportunity. And, you know, around acknowledging that people are at very, you know, different places and have very different circumstances. Um, it, it would be, be great to hear your thoughts, uh, Luis, about, you know, just some examples of, of how people can start to get engaged. Yeah, this is a great question. And I think that uh, from my point of view, there is no excuse to actually engage in happiness, on happiness, by happiness. Um, there is no excuse because it's, it's a personal decision. It's something that we decide. But actually when, you, when we see that the external conditions are not the right ones in order to, for people to flourish, then we can be accountable and take action in order to uh, fix and solve those conditions. So I think that happiness always has two sides. It's the, the way we embrace, we embody, we be, we are happiness, mm -hmm. and the way we actually help other people to maximize and purify the conditions. Because it's both sides. Uh, we saw on Monday during the Agora, it was all focused on mental health, that actually when you get into trouble with mental health, you need the conditions as well to change in order for you to embrace a happiness. So it's not always like we have 100% ownership of it. And it's not enough to choose. You have to choose to be. You have to be the change. You have to be the happiness that you want to see. But you have to be it. Because some people confuse and, and some people are saying, well, I choose happiness, sure. But when you choose it, and maybe you can grab it from somebody else. And that's not, the, that's not the right way to do it. The, the right way, actually, uh, International Day of Happiness Today just launched 10 steps to actually uh, maximize the impact of happiness. And the first one is you share it. So sharing is the first one, being grateful. It's, it's the second one to me. But actually, I think that we have to be very, very much conscious. I love uh, this spiritual leader, this mystic uh, from India called Sadhguru. He says that basically today in the world we have all the means, we have all the tools, we have all the evolution from so many places to actually maximize who we are as a societies and, and individuals. There is one thing that we're missing, which is consciousness. And I think that that's very important. And I think that that's a very important that we have to work on and this message goes to teachers, they, this message goes to CEOs, to governors, to presidents. We have to create the right conditions and we have to help people not to be unhappy. So this is very important. So we share a happiness and we create the conditions not to make other people unhappy. Sure. So it's, it's, a, it's a mix of focus on the sort of internal and, and, and way of being, but also taking action in the world. And then about reducing suffering, um, but then also trying to uh, actively cultivate well-being as as well. Um, okay, that's that's really that's really interesting. Thank you. Um, moving on to a, a bit about the strategy of the movement, um, Jamie, I'd be interested if you could share a little bit about what sort of systems of injustice that you touched upon a little earlier does do you see the movement uh, as responding to and um you know how, how do we best highlight these because uh in in campaigning you know one one classic thing we have to think about is how do we bring to consciousness that there is this problem that you know happiness levels have been declining and uh you know people are not um they're not meeting their basic human uh, spiritual uh, physical needs in, in many cases and that that is causing people um, to take destructive behaviors you know on, a, on an individual and, and, and collective level so yeah I'd be interested to know you know what, what sort of problems is is, is, the, is the movement really trying to uh, address uh, sure uh, another fantastic question uh, so thank you for that mm, um, yeah um, 
we are living in an interesting period whereby we are at a crossroads on many levels that you could describe as old world ideas. Um, and by that, I mean this sort of left right dynamic of poverty, you know, the rich versus the poor. Uh, the, uh, you're, you're either for climate change and progress and uh, you know, human rights or you, you're, you're, a, you're a Grinch and you don't like those things and you believe in uh, you know, identity, I say identity politics or one single identity. Um, uh, there are many ways to describe that. Uh, and then there is another uh, shift that's occurring, another fissure, if you will, and that's between new and old. And it goes beyond right and left. And uh, it has to do with, you know, the revolution that we've experienced in communications and technology and in consciousness as human beings that that has helped bring about. Uh, uh, we are communicating with each other and seeing each other and interacting in ways that didn't exist just 10, 15, 20 years ago. And that's really changed how we as, as, as people uh, expect to live, uh, what we expect from political leaders, what we expect from life. Uh, and we've begun to value things differently. And of course, the international, the global financial crisis of 2007, 2010 really opened the way for people and politicians to kind of begin the conversation about economic systems and economic ways. Mm -hmm. um, and so how, what, you know, to answer your question, what is this movement responding to? It's responding to the issues that we all face as a society, whether it be climate change, uh, poverty, uh, the, the extraordinary mental health crisis that we're facing all around the world. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about that just a little bit more in a second. Um, uh, but many of the things that we're dealing with that you just described in your question, are, are, are exactly what the global happiness and well-being movement address uh, by taking uh, a, a holistic approach as, as opposed to a sort of singular approach, um, being dynamic, uh, recognizing that uh, the things that drive human wealth aren't just money and material good, material wealth, but come from other sources of, of wealth and richness, such as our social relationships, our relationships with friends and family, uh, how we treat each other and how we interact with our, within our communities and between communities and between countries. Um, and so uh, to, to speak specifically about an example, the mental health crisis is a, is a great example where we're talking a lot about the crisis and we're saying, oh, there's this massive crisis. Uh, people are, are anxious, they're depressed, um, many of them are school kids. The economist just came out with a, with a report about just going into college entrance exams and the college admission process and the anxiety that children feel on uh, the teens feel trying to fit in. And, and, mm -hmm. and that, that is a major source uh, or trying to achieve or trying to compete with each other and, and have all these accolades as if that's what actually matters in life. Uh, and, and, and so when you look at that, what you have is a system a system that has, was invented around the 1700s. We call it capitalism. Uh, uh, there's different ranges of, of types of capitalism around the world, um, but we call it capitalism. Uh, the other word that people use is socialism um, uh, and, and uh, for, for other human development models that may be competitive to capitalism. But we are living in a, what you might call a capitalist society. And although there are many great things that capitalism has produced, including raising many people out of poverty and many of the things that we the, the quality of life that we all share today that is high in many respects. At the same time, we've created a system for ourselves that is unsustainable, that doesn't promote human health and well-being on an individual basis, on a community basis. It is at the source of many of the issues we face, whether it is climate change, whether it is uh, our political uh, systems uh, uh, and a corruption of democracy, uh, whether it is uh, the mental health crisis. All of those things are rooted in a system that is obsolete, and the happiness and well-being movement, the, the components, the ingredients, the DNA of what the happiness and well-being movement represents to society and is only just now sort of gaining steam, if you will, in the, in the recent last decade, um, specifically responds to the root causes of all the things that we are facing today. Uh, and and that, that, you know, that, that's why we, I, I have spent my time on the International Day of Happiness and believe in it so much. Uh, that's why I'm so happy to be working with Luis on this uh, and happy to be speaking to everyone today. Um, this every International Day of Happiness is a celebration. Every International Day of Happiness is an opportunity for us to pause and look at uh, our systems and to think about new ways to address the complex challenges that we face on a daily life basis and as a global community. Great, well, th that's a, a fantastic segue uh, to, to the next question. Thanks, Jamie. Um, so Luisa, the next question we have is, is about uh, engaging people. So 
I, I'd be grateful if you could say a little bit about what you see as the main challenges to making this movement really um, just very kind of self-sustaining and, and, and the main focus, I suppose, of, of people's lives that we, you know, we, we as the kind of existing system that, that has, has been destroying the, um, the Earth's ecosystem and at the same time uh, causing a, a lot of suffering, as we move away from that, what do you see as the main challenges and opportunities to engaging people into this, this story and this identity around, you know, how do we build lives of well-being, but also living in, in harmony with, uh, with all the other species on the planet? This, this is another great question. Uh, thank you so much. I think that we can see as many issues as we want and as many barriers that we, as we want to. The reality is that because we have the opportunity and I would say the responsibility to choose where to go and how to live our life, I think that this is, is very easy to solve um, because we have to choose. We have to choose the right way and we have to choose the, the, the right behavior rooted on values that we know work very well in order to sustain societies, such as compassion for oneself mm. and compassion for others, such as gratitude. So when we go for gratitude and compassion, we are not going to fail. We know that this is going to work. So this is uh, something that requires an holistic view of what's going on. We are living in systems and systems are interconnected. So I think that we want to exponentially move to 10 billion happy by 2050, which is an amazing goal. We are actually 7.6 billion people in the planet. By 2050, we are gonna be 10 billion. That's a lot of people. But actually I was just talking to Mogadad and his goal is 1 billion. But actually with Jamie and I, we are thinking of 10 because, and actually more agreed is that actually moving from 1 billion to 10 is, is not that difficult because we are living in an exponential world. We are living in a world of abundance. So when we understand the world as abundance and an exponential change, when they get to a tipping point, can move very fast. I think that we have to be very optimistic about what the future could look like. I think that we are a bit brainwashed by so much negativity that we get from the media in so many ways. The media knows how to really play with fear and, and they insist in playing in the fear space. Yeah. I think that we need much more mindful and conscious leaders in the media world. But we know when we go, when we go into facts that we can, we can achieve a lot more. I agree with Jamie that probably the system that we have right now, the economic system, doesn't help to maximize the potential. And now that's why we are thinking how happiness and well-being can become the system itself. So instead of, I've been many times to the World Economic Forum, and I like it a lot because you get all those amazing people talking about issues, but the framework is economy and economic growth. And when you frame issues, you are, re you are already giving the response. Yeah. That's why we believe in this World Happiness Fest, this World Happiness Agora's, where the main goal is to talk freely with no conditions and with no barriers about maximizing happiness and well-being because the framework is actually how we get into more happiness and less misery. It's not about economic growth. So I think that now we have the institutions, we have the frameworks, we have the people. We need to elevate this consciousness to all these people and give them the tools. So I think that we have to maximize the way we bring tools to people who don't have access. Uh, but right now, copy, paste, and uh, even <coughs> think of artificial intelligence. We know that ideas can get to the cloud and can go down and download into robots in seconds. So mm -hmm. this is gonna be an interesting way of actually maximizing the whole knowledge on the cloud, but actually it's not gonna be in our brains, it's gonna, it's gonna be in robots' brains. So actually thinking how to maximize the impact of these artificial intelligence robots and ourselves and our own evolution of human beings is going to be pretty interesting. So I would say that there are many ways. The first way is to make a conscious decision about accepting what's not working and going towards the good. Great. That, that, I mean, that sounds 
at once simple and powerful and it, it touches on this idea of you know mindset of abundance versus scarcity and um also ideas of you know frames of, of trying to think you know what what story are, are we actually living within you know what um what story is 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 creating our current reality and can we see that that is just a story um i, I quite like this metaphor of um you know framing and, and culture is sort of the, the water that we that we swim in you know that like uh, you imagine fish they they don't see the water that they're moving around in and stories and and mindsets and culture is kind of like that for us and i think bringing that awareness and realizing that we you know we can live in a in a different story of of abundance and uh, compassion instead of sort of fear and, and scarcity i think that uh, that's a a broad but a, a powerful um, place to to start to see opportunities for, for well-being and happiness in all of our lives that maybe we didn't realize existed there before. And uh, you know, both of your organizations have, have done great work around sharing research uh, that helps people to do that. You know, for example, uh, just a, a gratitude practice, you know, that's one of those wonderful things uh, that is, is free and, and can have a big impact. Um, Great. So I think it's, uh, it's time to move on to uh, a sort of little interactive exercise. Now, uh, in terms of m my, uh, my own uh, current well-being, I've been behind a computer quite a lot today, and I think our, uh, our two guests probably have as well, and perhaps quite a few of the attendees. So I'd like to um, invite you all just very briefly just to close your eyes and breathe in and hold and breathe out and repeat and as you breathe in just try and notice where you're holding some tension in your body and see if you can tense that even more and as you breathe out release that tension so breathe in tense and breathe out and um, hopefully that will just ground us a little bit before we get get back into our into our heads. Um, now, in in terms of uh, thinking a bit about where this movement is going, um, Luis, you you had a an exercise um, just to invite people to maybe contribute a bit to this this narrative that that. Uh, yourself and, and Jamie are building for, for the movement. Would you like to say just quickly a little bit about that? Yes, I think that um, one of the things that we are trying with the World Happiness Agora this week is to come out with, with a kind of manifesto that can build on some of the work that Jamie and I are doing together and we are going to be announcing uh, pretty soon. But basically bringing those ideas and those tools that can really activate and move different communities to different levels. So for example, during the, at the Agora, we are having five days, each day is focused on one big theme. Monday was health, yeah. and especially we focus a lot on mental health. Uh, Tuesday was education, today is about self-development, self-mastery, and social impact. Tomorrow is all about happiness at work. And on Friday is about technology and the role of transformative technologies. So I think that one call to action here, together with an interactive practice, is that everybody on the on, online think about tools, exercise, that can really become part of a kind of a compendium of initiatives that we can use, that we can really use. Um, so I think that, for example, on Monday we had an amazing, no, that was Tuesday, yesterday, amazing panel we wake up schools and i and i got a, a practical tool i would love to share uh, yes. that is basically at some point as you did with let's stop and a cup deep uh, breathing basically one of the tools uh, coming from singapore was basically you stop you breathe and you smile that's it you stop you breathe and you smile so when you do that in a consistent way and you think and you internalize that as a habit at some point in any moment 
of the day, you can do that. And actually, when you are smiling, we know that we are using mirror, mirror neurons and we are actually forcing other people always to smile. So mm -hmm. that was pretty cool. I, I love that. Uh, and another tool that actually I learned from Kristin, uh, who is, uh, I mean, kind of the, the big, big names and, 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 and the researcher who operational, operationalized self-compassion, is, is an exercise where you actually uh, stretch uh, your fingers uh, and then at some point you release. So you stretch and you release. It's amazing when you practice that. Just that is more exercise, is releasing so much stress. So I think that, um, I think those are tools. Those are small tools that can help a lot. A lot of the conversation we were having here is here. Uh, the other day is about babies. You have a baby, you become a, a parent, you know, um, and you see the, the baby cry and you realize that you don't know why they're crying. And you have to guess, but actually normally they cry only for four reasons, because they're hungry, because they want to sleep, because they have some gas in the body or because they feel a bit uncomfortable. So when you know that, and you know that it might be because of those reasons, you can comfort. I think social emotional intelligence is something that we are not ready. We have to maximize. And I will, we would love to invite, invite the whole well-being and happiness community to think how we can bring all these tools that are so practical, so effective, immediate, if I effect at some point and how, how to create this manifesto, not just from a theoretical and philosophical point of view, which is very important, mm. but a systemic point of view, which is very important, yeah. but actually on a practical level that can help uh, people. Great. Great. Well, I, I think maybe a good way to get people to engage, to engage with that in, in this session, because it would, it would be great to have some input from all around the world is to just, in the, in the rest of the session in, in the chat box, if, um, you know, whilst we're doing the, the audience Q&A, um, we'd just invite everybody on the webinar to, if you can, um, you, know, you have any tools that come to mind that you've found particularly impactful in your own life, uh, you know, it could be a simple exercise or it, it could be um, some tool around measuring how much time you're on the screen or something like this. Just uh, please do share it in the, in the chat box or anything else you, you think might be useful to contribute to uh, a manifesto around creating this, this world of our longing as, as Charles Eisenstein uh, uh, talks about it. And um, just, to, just to pick up on, I think you, you mentioned uh, Kristen, I think that's Kristen Neff, is that right, uh, Luis? Just in case anyone wanted to look up. Um, uh, sorry, yes, I, yeah. It's, it's, no, no problem, yeah, I, I'm sure you're on, you're on first name in terms of all, all of these happiness, uh, these well-being warriors, but uh, yeah, she has a book, Self-Compassion, which um, I'm yet to read, but I, I look forward to it. Uh, be an act of self-care to, to find, the, find the time to, uh, to do that. Um, so we're gonna move now into uh, uh, an audience Q&A, so, um, we'd love to hear any questions you have for our panelists. And the, the best thing to do is on the bottom of your uh, Zoom window, there's a, a little bar that should pop up and there's a Q&A section. Now, you should be able to post questions in there. Um, let me just see if there's any kind of setting I need to enable to let you do that. I think that should be good to go. Um, if for any reason you can't find that or um, it doesn't seem to be working, please do uh, post any questions in the chat and uh, Tracy from our team will, uh, will transfer them across. So let's have a look. Um, oh yes, Roger said spending time in nature in terms of a tool. Yeah, I think um, that is incredibly powerful. And um, in terms of research, you know, more and more science is coming out around the, the, the benefits of that. Um, Bert from the Netherlands, uh, he says he has a tool called Happy We. Um, you can share one good thing with others every day. Um, it's free and uh, also in English, that sounds fantastic. Um, Tracy's talked about uh, self-care, compassion, gratitude practice, all very powerful. Um, Oh yeah, and five minute journal is a, is a great tool to do that. Uh, and I think there's also something very powerful about just, you know, getting away from the screen and using your, 
using your hand to write on some some paper and uh it's amazing what can kind of come out uh, that way so while we're waiting for some oh here we go we've got a couple questions let's have a look um so we've got a question from Flo, which is uh, this is uh, Flo in Rotterdam. Um, how do we stay informed about the most important issues and news happening in the world without falling into negativity of the media that Luis mentioned? Um, thanks to, uh, to Luis and Jamie. Um, yeah, I think that is so interesting because really we could spend all of our energy and uh, our attention just soaking up all of the the negativity you know there's an endless supply so um jamie do you, do you have any thoughts around this in, in in your own life but for for people in general yeah um don't watch the news no, <laughs> <laughs> um no I, I i'm i'm partly joking and and i guess uh, but i'm serious at the same time and, and by that i mean um let me just say many of the suggestions that you mentioned in the, in the chat are actually great ideas to get away from the news and sort of the daily cycle of negative information, spending time in nature, uh, uh, taking time to, to, to be mindful and meditate uh, and just listen to the stillness of the universe and to, of your breath um, as you take deep breaths. Those are some very good practical everyday things that anyone can do to uh, sort of step out of the the, the, the daily cycle of, of news and information and, and the daily pressure of the day. Uh, let's, let's call it that. Uh, but let me say this, you know, it's important to remember that a lot of the areas and inflection points of our society, such as the media or the education system or the healthcare system, are all guided by the invisible hand of, of profit. And I don't mean to say that in a negative way, because those are the things that allow people to earn a living and make our society run and those types of things. And there really our society is a, is, is, is a, a marvel of human ingenuity. It's amazing that we've come in billions of years to arrive at the point that we are at now uh, as human beings. Um, but uh, when you think about news, uh, you know, they profit from more views. The news profits from, from drama, from things going badly. They don't profit from telling people about the good news. They don't talk profit from saying, hey, I'm just here to say everything's going well. They're there to bring you something that is, whether it's, you know, no matter the channel, they're there to bring you something that is going to raise eyebrows, generate interest, whether it's salacious, whether it's dramatic, uh, they're looking for information that's going to make you feel like there is anxiety. So I think going into every sort of news whether you look at the news or you get information sent to you via your iPhone or you read it during the day in whatever way that it comes to you, um, is to just always have a filter and remember that those organizations aren't just sort of this objective, unbiased news source. They are led and governed by a system of incentives that is systemic, that drives drama and that drives a sense of anxiety. Yeah. They make that there is a direct correlation with profit and anxiety. And um, uh, I'll leave it as that with that is if you can just remember that as you're watching the news, because I, I, I do watch the news, I, I work in, it in a field that obviously involves global development issues and requires staying on top of things. And, you know, there's negative information every day. Uh, and it seems like negative story after negative story. And, uh, and so it's, it's very difficult. And I have to remind myself that um, that, you know, this is, this is how they're in, the interest is in reporting negative news, not necessarily um, positive news. And, and looks like Tracy is posting a positive news. Absolutely great suggestion. Uh, we need more positive news. And I know there are a few initiatives to sort of bring more positive news out, um, but we haven't seen that yet in sort of the mainstream, if you will. Uh, uh, and so, and so hopefully those endeavors will continue to, 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 uh, well, to, 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 to make ground and change how our news and media is shared around the world. Fantastic. Well, I'm, I'm really glad you touched on, uh, on positive news. Uh, that, that's a, a publication I've been following sort of on and off for quite a, for quite a while. You know, they, they, they have these beautiful quarterly magazines. Um, and it's reminded me that I had a, an intention that uh, I just haven't got around to acting on to actually become a subscriber. So I suppose that's a, that's a potential <laughs> easy action for at least for me to do. Um, really interesting touching on the emotions that are triggered by news. I'm just going to post a link in the chat um, 
I'm going to try. Oh no, whoops, here we go. Um, and th there was a, a, a piece done by The Economist last year about which emotions are predominantly triggered on different social networks. And I think from memory, you know, Twitter was anger, um, Instagram was depression, Facebook was kind of a mix. And um, they had uh, they had an infographic. I'll, I'll just post it here. And there we go. Um, I thought that was really interesting to the point that I actually put it on my desktop to remind me, you know, and I, I you know, a lot of these things, they're real uh, mixed blessings, you know, they, they have big positives, but also big negatives. And I, I think if we can find ways to um, put boundaries around them a bit, um, something I personally find uh, very helpful, I found helpful in recent years, sort of a middle way, not, not really a Buddhist middle way, but um, the middle way of satire i guess you know finding out what's going on but um through a way that actually makes you laugh you know that you 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 stay informed but you're kind of you're laughing at the sort of ridiculousness of it and i think for me anyway it allows me to um stay engaged with what's happening without kind of falling into despair you know you can you can have a sort of righteous kind of laughing anger i guess <laughs> that then can lead you into into positive action um, so that's uh, that's a little something for me um i see we have got a couple other questions coming in so um bert has asked uh how can we move from knowing so sort of experts research to doing in the next era and perhaps you could extend that to being as well um how can we give more platform to initiatives that focus on creating the equivalent of brushing your teeth uh, so like an everyday happiness ha habit. And uh, Louisa, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Thanks, Jamie. Yeah, um, I love it. From, from knowing to do and to be, and I think that we have to start by being. Uh, and I think, that I, I think that this is very important because knowing is the essence in the world we are living today to make a big impact. So we have to know. It's not about believing, because believing is basically something that you are going to be committed, you are going to be attached, and actually you don't have the source. So you might believe in something, but it might be wrong or might be right, because you, you have not constructed. So from a philosophical point of view, knowing is very important. Uh, but once you know, and we don't know what we don't know, this is important, I think what is really important is to embody who we are, if we are something, and we are, of course we are. So be being, I would start by being. By being is centering into who we are. Um, we can center through many different practices. Yoga is one of them. I think yoga is bringing to the world something, and Marcus Hassan is, is a, the moderator for, for the Agora this week, is, 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 is showing how yoga and mindfulness can really bring us to the roots of who we are. So I think that we have to be first. And it's, it sounds a bit generic, but we have to learn how to be. And that's where we go in nature. That's why we meditate. That's why we basically breathe deep and we understand and we contemplate our thoughts. I think that we have to get into that state of being where we are gonna be combining the knowing with the being. And at some point we have to act. And in many ways, by acting, we are being already. So I think there is not, I mean, this is like, it's, it's the connection, it's, an, it's a system. So at some point you have to start with something. I would start with acting and being. So uh, I recommend everybody to think about that. How do you act into being? Because that's, that's probably the way we can move everything to the level that we want. Great, great. That's fantastic. Thanks, Luis. And uh, we, we have a question from Roger, um, which is really a, a perfect segue, actually, in, into, into wrapping up this fantastic webinar. Um, Roger's asked, uh, Luis, could you say a, a bit about the World, uh, the De World Happiness Virtual Agora? Uh, who, who's been there? What have you been uh, discussing? And um, then we can, we can move on to uh, a bit about how webinar attendees can uh, can get involved and, and catch the um, the final two days and and also see recordings of the the first two days absolutely I think we we believe in action by being and being by action so is the, is the so what, the way we structure the world happiness agora is 
is with two levels of connection. One is the physical connection. That's why we have 30 plus amazing Agora hosts in different cities around the world, more than 35 cities around the world, who are organizing live events. So like here, actually let me show you where we are here in Mexico. Uh, because this is Marcos, this is Ilgo. Hola. But this is a physical Agora. This is a space where we are getting ready for the next session, actually, in a few minutes with Mavis. Uh, and here we are bringing people physically and we are interacting. We are doing B-shops, which are basically, it's not workshop. We're not here to work. We are here to be. So we have these interactions, physical interactions, and this is going on now in all around the world. And then we have a global agenda where we are inviting and we already have more than 168 speakers and thought leaders, we call them guides, to share the insights uh, and to share what they know wow. and how to apply it. And we had people, amazing people like Ed Dinner. I mean, he's the kind of the father, he's Dr. Happiness. He's the father of subjective well-being. Or Dacher Kellner, who's the founder of the Greater Good Science Center. Yeah. Uh, have more of that, you know, he was a leader of Moonshots and his book about how to, um, to solve for happy is becoming one of formula of, of how to move things to another level. Or we had uh, Christine Neff, uh, Shana Shapiro. We have psychologists, we have researchers, we have activists, and we have spiritual leaders. Actually, Sadhguru is, is going to bring a big message. Is one of these mystics today that is not attached to any religions, but is bringing a lot of insights into connecting our minds with our soul uh, and with our beings. So we, we try to combine always the spirituality part. We are not afraid of talking about spirituality at all, because this is part of our lives. And actually, Tal Ben Sahar yesterday talked about the spy model, where it's about the spirituality, but it's about physical action, it's intellectual, it's emotional, it's about the way we are moving into understanding emotions and relationships and the spiritual level and the physical and the intellectual. So it's a combination. So Tal was here yesterday. Uh, today, right now, we have Mavis, which is one of those amazing psychologists that is bringing courage and love to hundreds of thousands of people around the, and around the world. We have pro-social. And Paul, and Paul is joining us later today, and he's bringing the science of conflict resolution into societies through pro-social pro uh, activities. Um, uh, we have hundreds of speakers. We are recording everything. Great. So it's gonna be available to everybody. And we invite you all to keep going. This is, doesn't stop with this week. We are gonna, be moving with more hours around the world, with more activities, with more institutions reporting. We are creating a network of networks, and we invite you all to be part of uh, this amazing community that we are co-creating. Wonderful. That's that's really great. I mean, I, um, I talking of sort of abundance. I'm I'm uh, really excited to to kind of dive in. I think. Uh, also, you know, mentioning nature connection earlier, we'll, we'll have to be careful to remember to uh, to go into nature because <laughs> with, uh, you know, one speaker for every hour of the week, uh, we could uh, easily spend all week, I suppose, behind our screens. But uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward myself to, to diving in. We have so many people connecting from, actually we have a Ted, which is the other host in Hong Kong. She brought everybody into nature or a Rania from Egypt. They took a faluka into the Nile and they went all into the river and they had the agora on the faluka out in nature. So you can actually combine both if you want. That's a, lo <laughs> that's a lovely idea. I think with um, you know people people's phone and uh, Wi-Fi coverage, that you know we can we can have it all. Um, so I'll just pop a link uh, to the. Um, the section of the virtual agora where I think it's possible to buy recordings and you, you have a code for us. Is that right? Are you happy for me to post that in the, in the chat? Yeah, that'd be fantastic. I mean, basically we can post the link um, here and with Agora 20, you get a $20 off. I mean, the, 
the, it's, it's really symbolic price. It just helps to keep the system alive, this $39. Great. But you have access to hundreds of hours of content. And as soon as we get some sponsors, uh, we'll, we'll make it for free. So mm -hmm. we, are, we, are, we, are, we really want to democratize the access of all this information. But Great. if you are at 20, you can get this uh, $20 off. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, that's, that's really kind. Um, it, w is there some free content as well? I, I got to confess, I, I have been a bit wrapped up with uh, this webinar and things I haven't been able to explore yet, but... Um, Actually, all live sessions are free. Oh, wow. Okay, great. So... More than 100. Wow. Okay. So how would you say that the best, peop the best way for people to check in with that, is it to keep an eye on, you know, to follow the the Happiness Agora Facebook page and see when you go live? Is that, is that a good way? That'd be great. I mean, you go to the website, happiness, uh, happinessagora.world, W-O-R-L-D, yep. happinessagora.world. You see the link here uh, by Ely. There you have the agenda and then you have links like this one to Zoom to all the sessions. And all those sessions are free. Then basically you pay a minimum amount and you want to keep it for yourself, but that's it. But it all content is free. All okay. Like that's fantastic. Well, thank you both so much for your time. It's uh, been really enjoyable to have a little glimpse into all that you're creating and to feel this, uh, this kind of connectedness to all of these uh, experts and all of these projects happening around the world. You know, it's, um, it's very inspiring. Uh, so I don't think we have any more questions, but I wish you both uh, a lot of luck and uh, presence and well-being with with the rest of the event and with all of your projects and we're very grateful to have had you share your your stories and just give us a little insight into all that you're creating and that we can we can now access through the the wonders of uh, of the internet so um louise and uh, jamie if you have time we can uh, just do a very, a very quick debrief i'll send you a, a link but everybody else thank you so much um just in terms of a final next action, I think you're, you're organizing a, a survey, aren't you, to contribute to the, the manifesto, is that, is that right? So maybe we can include a link to that in the follow-up email to the webinar. And if you've got some other ideas uh, to contribute, then uh, please do take that survey and you can um, provide some of the uh, inspiration and tools that you've come across in your own happiness and well-being journey to, to Happiness Agora, uh, and then that can spread out across the world. Thank you so much. Network Sounds Network. great. Thank you. Great. Well, it's great to meet you. Great to be in touch. And uh, thanks again for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank and you. Th thanks, everyone, for attending. Cheers. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.